Hi everyone, I am Dr. Ila Jain Khandelwal and this module we are going to discuss the pathology questions which were asked in the NEET uh, PG 2022 exam, right? If you ask me the overall gist of the exam students, most of the questions were from predictable topics like cellular aging or a lot of anemia questions were there. Uh, one or two questions were a bouncer which I am going to discuss with you in detail, right? Uh, this is the pattern most of the time which is asked in the questions. I have told you so many times times that anemias are the uh, one of the most sought after topics right so let us start with the question students the first question was all of the following are true about neutrophil extracellular traps except they are seed in sepsis it's a battle between bacteria and neutrophils mitochondrial dna is seen it is chromatin with antibacterial enzymes what is the answer which you people have written that's correct students the answer is mitochondrial dna is seen do you think neutrophil extracellular traps have mitochondrial dna no they don't have any relation with mitochondrial dna now this topic students of neutrophil extracellular traps remember i have told you many times that this has been added in the 10th edition of robbins that is why it is a very very potential exam question right uh, what is usually any team it is basically extracellular fibrillar meshwork which is produced by neutrophils at the site of infection and what is the purpose of this NET or extracellular meshwork the basic purpose is to trap the microbes or to trap the microorganisms so that the infection cannot spread right so it releases high concentration of antimicrobial substances at the site of infection right it prevents the spread of microbes and arginine is the in uh, amino acid which is involved in its production right so for future exams two very potential questions one is which amino acid is involved in the production of NADs? Answer is arginine. The second is this image which can also be our students. This extracellular meshwork is basically NAT, right? Now, let us see the options which were given in this question. It is seen in sepsis. This is absolutely true. It is seen in sepsis. It is a bacterial between bacteria and neutrophil. That is also true. These are extracellular fibrillar meshwork which is produced by the neutrophils, right? This is also true. My Mitochondrial DNA is seen? No, there is no relation with mitochondrial DNA. It is chromatin with antibacterial enzymes. That is absolutely correct, right? So, which of the following is a false statement, students? Mitochondrial DNA is seen. Easy? Okay, next question. Post-mortem changes seen in lung after the death of a patient from COVID after a week are... Remember students I told you COVID is a very very potential topic and now in both high and ICT and NEET exams COVID can definitely be asked. Now the 9th edition of Robbins they added one or two lines on COVID-19 infection and what they said is that in COVID-19 uh, infection the lung pathology which we see is diffuse alveolar damage and what happens in diffuse alveolar damage students? There is a depth position of fibrin right pink hyaline membrane like thing that is fibrin layer is deposited in the lung alveoli which is called as diffuse alveolar damage which is also seen in adult respiratory distress syndrome right so the same pathology will be seen in the lung of a patient with covid-19 infection right that is why what will be the answer in this question a thick layer of fibrin right this is the answer what are the other options Fresh and old intraalveolar hemorrhage, no. Perivascular cuffing, no. Pulmonary artery hypertrophy with increased resistance, no. Right. How does this uh, uh, fibrin deposition look like? In this image, can you people appreciate within this alveoli, this pink layer which is seen here? This pinkish layer. This is basically a thick layer of fibrin which can be deposited in the alveoli of a patient with COVID-19 infection. Easy? Both of them were predictable questions which we know are from the topics which are usually asked in the exams, right? Next, 
a known case of hemorrhoids presented with fatigue after 6 months of blood loss right the patient's hemoglobin was 9 gram percent mcv was 60 mchc was 27 mch was 23 rbc count was 5.2 million cells per millimeter cube peripheral smear was uh, given what is the next investigation you will do this was a slightly tricky question right now, many of the students told me that, ma'am, uh, the entire profile of a patient with blood loss due to hemorrhoids and patient has anemia, you can see MCV is low. That means what kind of anemia does this patient have? Microcytic hypochromic anemia. The peripheral smear in this patient is also showing these cells which are smaller and they have more than one third pallor, right? So, these are also microcytic hypochromic red cells now when you see this profile you are sure that this patient has got iron deficiency anemia so what is the investig next investigation you will do you must have written serum ferritin that is the answer which many of you gave me but that is not correct students unfortunately serum ferritin is not the answer in this question right why First of all, students, let us see uh, the uh, investigations in this patient. I am saying that the patient's hemoglobin is low. That means the patient has anemia for sure. MCV is low, that is 60. My patient has got microcytic anemia. What are the DDs for microcytic anemia? Remember this table which I told you? Whenever the MCV is low, in the MCQ exam, you are going to think about CETA, sideroblastic anemia, iron deficiency anemia, thalassemia or anemia of chronic disease, right? So, I am going to think about these four things. Out of these, this does not look like sideroblastic anemia because in that there is iron overload. Here, there is no history of iron overload. This is not the answer. Anemia of chronic disease is also not likely. So, the two options which I am left with is iron deficiency anemia and thalassemia, right? I am confused between them. Now, the next is the RBC count. Let us see the RBC count. It is 5.2 million cells per millimeter cube. Is this normal students 5.2 milli, uh, million per millimeter cube? No. RBC of 5.2 is basically not low, right? It is normal or in, on the higher side. If my patient has got iron deficiency anemia, the RBC count cannot be normal or it cannot be on the higher side. It has to be on the the lower side right so first catch was the rbc count which is not low right in iron deficiency anemia it has to be low the second students remember i told you that to differentiate iron deficiency anemia and thalassemia we do a index which is called as the mentzer index remember i told you now the concept which you have to apply in this question is mentzer index the formula for Menzer index is MCV upon RBC count. Now, what is the MCV which is given in this question? The MCV is given as 60. What is the RBC count which you have? That is 5.2 million. So, almost 5 I will say. When you divide this, it comes out to be almost 12. And remember students, I told you, whenever the Menzer index is less than 12 or 12, we think in terms of thalassemia, whenever it is more than 13, you think more in terms of iron deficiency anemia, right? Because here it is 12, you will start thinking in terms of thalassemia, thalassemia trait, right? This patient can have thal trait and that is why what is the next investigation which I am going to do? The answer has to be HbA2 level. That is the next investigation. What is the HbA2 in a patient? of thal trait, it is going to be between 3.5 to 9 percent. The normal is 2 to 3.5. When it is usually 3.5 or 4 to 9 percent, we think about thal trait, the HbA2, right? So, the next investigation for sure in this question is not serum ferritin. It is going to be HbA2 level, right? So, what was important in this question was to look at the RBC count to calculate the Menzer index because the examiner gave you all all the things how to calculate the Menser index in this one. Easy? Okay. Next one.
ट्रू स्टेटमेंट ऑफ टीलोमरेज थ्योरी ऑफ एजिंग नाउ ऑन सेलुलर एजिंग स्टूडेंट्स दिस एग्जाम गेव एग्जाम हैड टू क्वेश्चन वन ऑन हाउ टू इंक्रीज सेलुलर लाइफ स्पैन एंड द अदर वॉज ऑन द टीलोमरेज थ्योरी ऑफ एजिंग एजिंग इज अ वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टॉपिक एंड इन नीट एग्जाम आई हैव सीन दैट एवरी ईयर दे आस्क वन और टू क्वेश्चन ऑन सेलुलर एजिंग राइट नाउ ट्रू स्टेटमेंट ऑन दिस थ्योरी increase telomere length is proportional to aging telomere mutation is associated with increased aging decrease telomere length is associated with aging and increased telomerase as, as activity is associated with aging these were the four confusing options many students told me that ma'am we got confused and that is why we messed up the question right first of all let us get our basic corrected right what is a telomere and what is a telomerase right what are telomeres right first of all let me tell you what are telomeres so remember students these telomeres they are short repeat sequences of nucleotides which are present at the ends of chromosome suppose this is a chromosomal end at this chromosomal end we have a short repeat sequence and the sequence is usually T T A G G G. This is the usual sequence which is seen. T T A G G G. They are short repeat sequence of nucleotides at the ends of chromosome. Right. Now the concept which they say is that telomere shortening, telomere shortening leads to cell aging. They say with every cell division, the telomere will keep on shortening, and ultimately the cell will keep on aging, and ultimately the cell will die. Right. So, what is associated with cellular aging is telomere shortening, not telomere lengthening. The first concept which I take home from here is that telomere shortening leads to cellular aging. Very important. Right. The next thing which you need to know from here is that there is an enzyme. time which is called as telomerase now this telomerase enzyme it increases the length of telomeres right it keeps on synthesizing more telomeres if telomeres are synthesized more will the cell age no so it leads to decreased cellular aging it will lead to reduced cellular aging understood easy concept students that is why students this enzyme telomerase is also called as the immortality gene and it is involved in a lot of cancers right sometimes when a cancer develops we say the cancer cells are immortal how do they become immortal because sometimes they have a constitutive activation of telomerase if telomerase is there telomere will keep on synthesizing the cell will not age it will keep on proliferating and therefore there will be the development of cancer easy right the next question which can come from this is which cells have got maximum telomerase activity right so maximum telomerase activity is usually seen in cancer cells or you all know it can also be seen in germ cells or it can be seen in stem cells but very poor or no telomerase activity is usually seen in somatic cells understood easy till now now let us see this question students which was given to all of you okay now let us see this question which was given to all of you increase telomere length is proportional to aging is this true no we have already done decrease telomere length is proportional to aging not increase right telomere mutation is associated with increased aging we will do it later on let's leave it from here because this was very uh, controversial telomere mutation decrease telomere length is associated with aging this is an absolutely correct statement you had to tell the true statement and this is absolutely correct decrease telomere length is associated with cellular aging increase telomerase activity is associated with aging no decrease telomerase activity is associated with aging so this is also wrong so which statement is true to students it is decrease telomere length is associated with aging understood few things regarding this other things which can be asked in your mcq exams one is werner syndrome this was asked in the neat exam 
two years back student 2020 NEET exam what is Werner syndrome it is the syndrome of premature aging due to a defect in DNA helicase enzyme right uh, something like progeria Amitabh Bachchan had progeria in that movie Pa right in which Amitabh Bachchan and his organs they aged very early this is a similar disease of premature aging called as Werner syndrome not Wormer which is men to men one syndrome right so this is due to defect in DNA helicase right then students hay flick limit was asked in the INICT exam 2021 what is hay flick limit they say normal cells will divide approximately 60 to 70 times in their entire lifespan how many times 60 to 70 times and that is called as the hay flick limit normally cells divide undergo 60 to 70 cell divisions in their entire lifespan this is called as hay limit another very potential exam question telomerase i have already told you it inhibits cellular aging it keeps on synthesizing the telomeres that is why it is called as the immortality gene maximum telomerase activity is seen in cancer cells stem cells germ cells no in somatic cells easy this was another question on cellular aging in the same paper which of the following will increase the lifespan or delay the aging process right regular exercise decreased stress decreased calorie by 30 percent or pharmacological intervention by taking ppis this is a very interesting question students remember when i taught you cellular aging i taught you two very important things which inhibit cellular aging right one is calorie restriction increases the lifespan this is the line which has been added in the ninth edition of robbins calorie restriction increases the lifespan if you eat less if you reduce the number of calories you will increase the lifespan so with that line i am going to do this solve this question decrease calorie by 30 percent calorie restriction will increase the lifespan so it becomes very easy right it has increased the lifespan right and the second important thing which will increase the lifespan is sirtuins these are the latest molecules and now in the next NEET exam, you can get a question on sirtuins also, right? What are these sirtuins? They are NAD dependent protein deacetylases. They will increase the longevity. They have a role in diabetes myelitis, cancer or cellular aging. And calorie restriction will increase the lifespan and they will decrease cellular aging. One another thing which increases the sirtuin level is red wine, right? Wine consumption increases the lifespan also or increases the longevity. That does not mean that you keep on consuming red wine. It is also unhealthy. Excess of everything is bad. But yes, two things which you have to take home from here. Sirtuins will increase the lifespan. How can you increase the sirtuins by red wine consumption? And calorie restriction will increase the lifespan correct easy so these are the questions which can be asked from this topic of cellular aging and uh, something uh, similar can be asked in the future exams also right next a patient has got raised LDH raised bilirubin and hemoglobin urea what is the most likely associated with right and the peripheral smear was given here right now see this question students when my patient has got raised LDH, hyperbilirubinemia and hemoglobin urea, what will you think about? This is the classical profile of intravascular hemolysis, right? When do you see hemoglobin urea and hyperbilirubinemia? Whenever my patient has got intravascular hemolysis. Simple story. See this image now, the peripheral smear which was given. In this peripheral smear, can you people appreciate these cells which are there? Don't you think these cells look like as if it is a helmet, right? So, these are basically the helmet cells. And you people already know in which conditions do we see helmet cells. These helmet cells or fragmented red cells are seen in microangiopathic hemolytic anemias like HUS, TTP, DIC or prosthetic cardiac walls. Remember, 
I told you this is the ima uh, image which I showed you students uh, the peripheral smear showing these kinds of cells which look like a helmet or a cap these are called schistocytes or helmet cells or fragmented red cells and they are seen in microangiopathic hemolytic anemias like HUS, TTP or DIC and prosthetic cardiac walls easy right now when I see this question let us let me see the answers uh, okay I have told you with the history you think that this is also a case of intravascular hemolysis can you tell me in which conditions to be seen intravascular hemolysis this is the table which I told you PNH PCH Maha that is HUS TTP DIC G6 period deficiency infections like malaria and prosthetic cardiac walls all of them can show intravascular hemolysis correct now let us go back to the question this whole scenario of intravascular hemolysis and schistocytes or helmet cells uh, what is it most likely associated with one option is splenomegaly is splenomegaly seen in intravascular hemolysis no absolutely wrong no, not the answer mechanical second heart sound that can be possible uh, because mechanical second heart sound nahi, this was mechanical second heart wall prosthetic cardiac wall which were they, they were talking about in prosthetic cardiac walls I see intravascular hemolysis and I see schistocytes or helmet cells so this is the most likely answer let us see the other options increased hpa2 increased hpa2 will be seen in which condition we just did thalassemia minor or thalassemia trait thalassemia has got extravascular hemolysis so this cannot be the profile and the peripheral smear is going to show you target cell so this is also wrong last option is goiter that does not make sense so the answer is mechanical second heart valve easy right so now you understood how to tackle such questions this was a direct question right next question students neoplastic cells utilize warburg metabolism for which of the following reasons decreased glucose utilization by neoplastic cells useful to make intermediates for survival yields more energy in the form of increased atp production makes the cancer cells immortal now warburg effect students have told you many times that this is a very very potential exam topic it was uh, warburg effect was given by sir or otto von warburg right and he got the nobel prize for the same as well right now first option is decreased glucose utilization by neoplastic cells no in warburg effect there is increased glucose utilization and not decrease glucose utilization by neoplastic cells so this option is wrong useful to make intermediates for survival this is absolutely correct if you read robbins they have given that what is the basic purpose of cancer cells undergoing or doing warburg effect right the main purpose is to make intermediates for survival right Yields more energy in the form of increased ATP production? No, this is also wrong because it produces less energy, right? Makes the cancer cells immortal? No. What will make the cancer cells immortal? The telomerase, not the Warburg effect, right? So, what is the best answer here? Used to make intermediates for survival. Easy? Okay, next question identify the given structure a lot of students uh, told me that ma'am we were unable to do this question identify the given structure this is the latest trend in the NEET and the INICT exam students now that they give a normal histopathology slide a normal histology slide and they will ask you the basic thing like once the stomach slide was given and this time this slide was given and they wanted you to identify the marked structure was this right they wanted you to identify this structure which was marked I am marking it A correct with an arrow now one thing is lymph node right does this look like a lymph node to all of you I don't think so because I have shown you how a lymph node looks like so many times students this is the normal histology of a lymph node it consists of lymphoid follicles these are the lymphoid follicles which are there and these lymphoid follicles have got germinal centers right 
so it has got lymphoid follicles with germinal center so this is the normal histology of a lymph node all these are blue colored cells are the lymphocytes which are present so the image which was given certainly did not look like a lymph node this did not look like because this looks like a duct and these look like some other cells right then the next option was glomerulus does this look like a glomerulus not at all students i'll show you how a glomerulus look like you all know how to interpret a kidney biopsy in this biopsy 1 2 3 these are the glomeruli 4 right and this one another one is there 5 and these are the tubules so these are the glomeruli which are there these are the tubules which are there this is a vessel which was there and this space in between the glomeruli and tubules is the interstitium right so what we see the is glomeruli along with tubules and interstitium does this look like a kidney biopsy no the third option was demi lune which are some lining of the secretory ducts and the last was pancreatic islet cells this is actually the pancreatic islet cells so another way you could have attempted this question is by exclusion exclusion is a very very important means of doing question students you can exclude multiple options and then come to a conclusion that that yes this is the answer this is the property by uh, with which we solve a lot of mcqs right so why after doing exclusion you can come to a conclusion that these are the pancreatic islet cells right so what is the this arrow mark thing students these are the pancreatic islet cells what are these students the acinar cells of the pancreas these are basically the acinar cells of the pancreas and this is a duct easy so the answer which we have in this question is basically the pancreatic acinar cells this is how they look like these are the acinar cells or the islet cells which are there and these are the acinar cells i'm sorry pancreatic islet cells not acinar cells clear easy story next question A 56-year-old male patient complains of dragging pain in the abdomen. Whenever there is dragging pain, which is given, it usually indicates splenomegaly because spleen, when it is enlarged, produces dragging pain. On examination, there is massive splenomegaly. There is high TLC, high platelets, and high hemoglobin. Peripheral smear is shown below. The patient had 2 to 3% blast and metamyelocyte 7% what is the translocation seen in this condition this was a fairly easy question students can you tell me what is the diagnosis now i will simplify the story here have you uh, know the do you know the keywords in this question 56 year old patient with massive splenomegaly with leukocytosis and a peripheral smear showing different cells of the myeloid series the first thing you will think about is chronic myeloid leukemia cml so the diagnosis in this case is cml do you have any other diagnosis in this case no i just have this this one massive splenomegaly with leukocytosis and a smear which is showing multiple cells of the myeloid series which starts looking like a bone marrow shows immature cells of the myeloid series think about one thing that is cml what is the most common translocation which you see in cml answer is t9 is to 22 so that is the answer simple straight forward question students of cml very very important right let us see the other options t8 is to 22 translocation usually seen in burkitt lymphoma 15 is to 17 translocation seen in AMLM3 that is uh, rara right 8 is to 14 also seen in burkitt lymphoma the most common translocation is 8 is to 14 which leads to CMYC amplification easy 
right very very important question students so cml is very potentially asked let me tell you something about cml the peripheral smear starts looking like a bone marrow this is the ps i can see leukocytosis i will see all the cells of the myeloid series the promyelocytes myelocytes metamyelocytes band forms neutrophils and also in addition i can see basophilia correct next The, when you do the bone marrow aspirate of this patient, you will see two things, students. One is a pseudo Gaucher cell. Gaucher cell has got crumpled tissue paper appearance of cytoplasm. It is seen in Gaucher's disease. A similar cell with crumpled tissue paper appearance seen in CML is called as a pseudo Gaucher cell. In this cell, can you people appreciate this meshwork, right? Of crumpled tissue paper cytoplasm. This look like a Gaucher cell. That is why this is but not seen in Gaucher's disease. That is why it is called as a pseudo Gaucher cell. Another thing which I see on the bone marrow aspirate is a sea blue histiocyte. Another thing which I see is sea blue histiocyte. These things are seen on the bone marrow aspirate. Then. What is the translocation which you see? Ninety-five percent of the patient have got T nine S two twenty two translocation. When this translocation happens, there is a fusion of B C R and A B L, right? And that leads to the development of Philadelphia chromosome. That also leads to activation of tyrosine kinase. You all know that tyrosine kinase is a growth signaling pathway. So that will lead to myeloproliferation. All the cells of the myeloid series. Starts proliferating like the promyelocytes, myelocytes, metamyelocytes, right? Along with basophilia, right? Very, very important question. That is why what is the symptomatic treatment which you can give in this patient? I can give a drug which is called as imatinib misalate, which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor because there is a activation of tyrosine kinase. I can give give this drug uh, imatinib misalate, which is a tyrosine kinase. inhibitor easy next this is also asked a lot of time students the criteria for the accelerated phase of cml right now cml occurs in three phases students one is the chronic phase another is the accelerated phase and last is the blast crisis what are the criteria for diagnosis of this phase chronic phase when the blast count is less than 10% when the blast count is between 10 to 19% we call it as the accelerated phase and blast crisis when it is more than 20% now in the mcq exam what other question they normally ask you is which one of the following is not seen in the accelerated phase of cml right let us see one criteria is the blast count between 10 to 19% peripheral blood basophilia more than 20% so basophilia is also a diagnostic criteria when it is more than 20% it is usually diagnostic of the accelerated phase persistent thrombocytopenia unrelated to therapy or thrombocytosis which is unresponsive to therapy right then increasing spleen size and increasing wbc unresponsive to therapy and lastly cytogenetic evidence of clonal evolution that is t9 is to 22 these six are the diagnostic criteria commonly students get confused between thrombocytosis and thrombocytopenia which is usually seen and they keep on asking me questions on that both the things are the diagnostic criteria thrombocytopenia unrelated of therapy and thrombocytosis which is unresponsive to therapy understood next lastly students we do a fish analysis which is the diagnostic technique in cml a uh, fish we can do this technique whenever we know the loci right so what happens uh, in this image this is the normal the green signal is the bcr and the red signal is the abl whenever there is translocation which is happening what will happen the red and green will fuse for example in this image can you people see the red and green have fused with 
Chichi Tatar. So whenever you get such a scenario, you will say that this is T9 is to 22 and my patient has got CML. Immediately you start the patient on Gleevec or Imatinib Misalate, right? Another test which we do in a case of uh, CML is the NAP score, the Neutrophil Alkaline Phosphatase score or the LAP score that is leukocyte alkaline phosphatase score. This score is decreased in patients of CML, the NAP or the LAP score. Understood? Easy? Done with CML? Very, very important topic. Next, a 45 year old male patient underwent a cystoscopy which showed multiple yellow white plaques in the bladder. Histopathology shows infiltrated lamina propria. What is the diagnosis? This was the image given. Remember students, this is a spotter. I used to show you this image. This is actually malacoplakia and these bluish colored bodies which they are pointing out. These bluish basophilic bodies or concretions which they are pointing out. They are called as Michaelis Gutman bodies, right? So, they are what they are, are they? They are Michaelis Gutman bodies which are seen in malacoplakia. The Michaelis Gutman bodies. Understood? easy. So, this was a spotter which was asked. Actually, this was a bouncer also because some students said, ma'am, we missed this slide. If you missed this slide, you might have not done this question correctly. Let us see the other options. Interstitial cystitis. Do you think this looks like cystitis? In cystitis, you need to see inflammatory cells. I can't see any inflammatory cells. Acute cystitis, not certainly. Chronic cystitis, not certainly. So, answer is milacoplakia. That was the answer. What is milacoplakia, students? Usually, it is a chronic inflammatory reaction caused by a chronic infection with Escherichia coli or Proteus infection. Basophilic concretion called as Michaelis Gutman bodies can be seen in the bladder biopsy. Otherwise, it presents as yellowish plaques as it is given, yellowish white plaques in the bladder. Easy? Next, a 6 year old male patient presents with abdominal pain. He was admitted with history of chest infections 2 years back. Pallor is present on examination. The HPLC shows raised HBF and HBS. What is the most likely diagnosis? Now, this was an easy one. Let us simply see the HPLC which shows increased fetal hemoglobin and increased sickle cell hemoglobin. If my patient has got increased sickle cell hemoglobin and the patient has got history of chest infections two years back and abdominal pain now, that means what are these symptoms suggesting? These symptoms are suggesting some kind of crisis, right? The vaso-occlusive crisis, sequestration crisis, right? So, whenever this history is present, you think about one diagnosis that is sickle cell anemia. So, beta thalassemia, no. Sickle cell anemia is the answer. In PNH or AIHA, the electrophoresis or HPLC is going to be normal. So, this cannot be the answer. The answer here is sickle cell anemia. I will tell you the reason why the age of the patient. Then HPLC showing raised sickle cell hemoglobin and the history of any crisis, right? What are the other keywords which you can see in a patient of sickle cell anemia? See, Usually male and female equally affected. A child history is usually seen. What is the pathogenesis? Miss Sun's point mutation in which glutamic acid is replaced by valine at the sixth position of beta chain of hemoglobin, which will lead to the production of HBS. Once in the MCQ exam, there was this history which was given of crisis and then they asked you what is the basic pathogenesis of the disease which the patient is suffering from. The one of the option was miss sense point mutation and that was what that was the answer correct then in the history you have pallor jaundice autosplenectomy and the features of crisis like bone pains acute chest syndrome fractures recurrent infections all of them can be there so history of crisis like bone pain fracture chest pain can be there then there is usually extravascular hemolysis 
Sometimes they can give you a peripheral smear which is showing you sickle cells. Special tests which you can do are sickling tests, electrophoresis and HPLC. One of the best tests which we perform is HPLC and in this question it is given that the HPLC, HBS level is high and the treatment we can give is hydroxyurea can provide symptomatic relief because hydroxyurea what it does is it increases the level of fetal hemoglobin and fetal hemoglobin decreases sickling. Understood? Easy story students. Now you know this was a straightforward question. Few other things which you have to remember for sickle cell anemia because it is usually asked in the exam. The x-ray skull will show a crew cut or hair run and appearance. Why? Because of hematopoiesis occurring in the skull bones, right? It is present in both thalassemia and sickle cell anemia. If both are the options, better answer to mark is thalassemia, correct? Then electrophoresis, when we do the electrophoresis students I told you from positive to negative the mnemonic is HAFSA, this is the mnemonic from positive to negative right. So that means at this position we have HPH, then HPA, F, S and A2, these are the bands and the positions in which we see. Normally uh, we have adult hemoglobin 95 to 97 percent, less than 1 percent is fetal hemoglobin and 2 to 3.5 percent is HbA2 which is present, right. This is the normal hemoglobin level which is present. If my patient has got raised level of fetal hemoglobin, you have to think about beta thalassemia major. If my patient has got raised level of HbA2, think in terms of beta thalassemia trait. If sickle cell hemoglobin is high, think about sickle cell anemia. Easy? See, in this patient, we have adult hemoglobin, fetal and A2. This is a normal pattern. If my patient has got sickle cell anemia, you will see fetal hemoglobin and sickle cell hemoglobin. A2 can also be present. If my patient has got beta thalassemia, then fetal hemoglobin level is high, right? Next, this is HPLC or high performance liquid chromatography. It is a simple test which will give you the percentage of various types of hemoglobins. That is why this is one of the best test tests now for hemoglobinopathies diagnosis, right? Next question, a 10 year old child with pain in the bone and bone shows sclerotic changes, peripheral smear is as shown. Most common organism implemented in osteomyelitis of this patient. Now, earlier they used to ask a direct question, uh, the organism which is responsible for the osteomyelitis and sickle cell anemia is. This was a question two years back. Now, they have also made it a clinical question, right? They have said that the patient has pain in the bone. Peripheral smear is showing sickle cells. Can you people appreciate? These are all sickle cells present. That means my patient has got sickle cell anemia. Now they want to ask you most common organism implemented in osteomyelitis. What is the answer? Salmonella. So the organism which is responsible for osteomyelitis in sickle cell anemia is salmonella. Thus this is the answer. Easy? Next. Which of the following mutation results in the formation of a stop codon? Another very easy question students, stop codon. In which type of mutation do you see? Remember I told you students what is a mutation? It is a permanent heritable change in DNA. And I told you that these mutations are basically of two types. One is called as a point mutation. Another is called as a frame shift mutation. What happens in a point mutation? Single nucleotide change or a single loci change, right? Now, this point mutation can be of three types students. It can be a silent mutation or it can be a missense point mutation or it can be a nonsense point mutation. Please try to recollect we did all of this in genetics, right? What is a silent point mutation students? A silent point mutation is the one in which a single nucleotide will change. That means it is a mutation, but it will not change the amino acid and protein. They will remain the same, right? So that is a silent mutation. What is a missense point mutation? Single nucleotide change will produce a different amino acid and different protein. And the example of this is sickle cell anemia. We just did, right? Last is a nonsense mutation. Why is it called as nonsense? Because 
there will be a single nucleotide change and that will lead to the production of a stop codon. Which stop codons am I talking about? UAA, UAG and UGA. That is why it is called a nonsense mutation. Why? Because the protein synthesis will stop here, right? It will lead to the production of a stop codon, right? So, here the question was, which mutation will result in the production of a stop codon? The answer is very simple, the nonsense mutation right what is a frame shift mutation students whenever there is an insertion or deletion of one or two nucleotides it will lead to a shift in the reading frame of dna the entire reading frame of dna will shift that is called as a frame shift mutation usually seen in thalassemia thalassemia can show both frame shift mutation and nonsense mutation easy right next question which of the following disorder is inherited in an autosomal recessive manner, right? Now, on these different modes of inheritance, their examples are extremely important, I have told you. And in FMGE, NEET or INICT, all the exams, some or the other way their examples are asked, right? Here, this was a direct question, which of the following disease is inherited in an autosomal recessive manner, right? We have cystic fibrosis, Huntington's disease, achondroplasia, teacher colon disease. Best answer here is cystic fibrosis. This is inherited in an autosomal recessive manner. Huntington disease, I'll just tell you the mnemonic, right? He has a very dominant father. Huntington's disease is autosomal dominant. Achondroplasia is autosomal dominant. Teacher colon has no specific mode of inheritance. Cystic fibrosis is autosomal recessive. That is why this is the answer. This is a direct mugging up question. The mnemonics which I have told you for all the four types. Autosomal dominant, let us quickly revise. He has a very dominant father. Huntington's hereditary spherocytosis. Achondroplasia, von Willebrand's VHL. Dystrophia myotonica. Osteogenesis imperfecta. Marfan syndrome. Intermittent porphyria. Neurofibromatosis type 1. Adult onset polycystic kidney disease. Neurofibromatosis type 2. Tuberous sclerosis. And familial... Uh, adenomatous polyposis and familial hypercholesterolemia. In short, any structural protein defect will be autosomal dominant. Any enzyme deficiency will be autosomal recessive. What are the examples of autosomal recessive disorder? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. This is the mnemonic curve which I have created. A for ataxia or alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency or alkyptonuria, enzyme defects. B for beta thalassemia. C for congenital adrenal hyperplasia or cystic fibrosis. D for deafness, E for M for SMA, alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency I am talking about. F for Friedrich's ataxia. G for Gaucher's disease, glycogen storage disorders, again enzyme deficiencies. H for hemochromatosis, homocystinuria, enzyme deficiencies. I for inborn errors of metabolism. Easy? Then students, we have X-linked recessive disorders. These are also very commonly asked. Lady Harding College girls don't care about foolish words. That's the mnemonic and these are the examples. Leschnein syndrome, hemophilia A and B, Hunter syndrome, C for color blindness, G for G6PD deficiency, D for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, C for chronic granulomatous disease and color blindness, A for A gamma globulinemia, they are talking about Bruton's A gamma globulinemia, F for Febreze disease and fragile X syndrome, W for Viscott Aldrich syndrome, right? All these are the examples of X linked recessive disorders, very, very important. Then lastly, we have examples of X-linked dominant disorders in which we have the mnemonic of Ravi. R for Red syndrome, A for Alpert syndrome, V for vitamin D resistant rickets and I for incontinentia pigmenti. These are all X-linked dominant disorders. You can get a question from any of these examples. So, be rest assured that this can be asked in future exams as well, right? Next. A 27-year-old male patient with road traffic accident develops dyspnea, petechial rash and unconsciousness after two days. What is the most likely cause? Air embolism, fat embolism, thromboembolism. 
Remember students, I told you that after a RTM, after 1 to 3 days, if my patient has got dyspnea or thrombocytopenia or a rash, you start thinking in terms of fat embolism, right? It usually occurs after fracture of long bones which may occur after road traffic accidents, right? The bones when they break up, whenever there is an accident, there is bone marrow. My bone marrow has got fat, right? And when this fat can also impact in the vessels that will lead to fat embolism right this was a classical history of fat embolism it will occur or manifest one to three days after a road traffic accident or a fracture right what usually happens the patient will suddenly develop dyspnea tachypnea tachycardia a rash why will a rash there because of thrombocytopenia? Why will be there decreased platelet count? The decreased platelet count will be there because these platelets which are there, they will start and combining with the uh, fat. They will start attaching to the fat, so the platelet count will reduce. So, my patient will have thrombocytopenia. Understood? So, this is the classical history which we see. Right? So, this was a case of fat embolism. When do you see air embolism students? We see air embolism in deep sea divers. It is called as Caisson's disease or decompression sickness because of the presence of bubbles. Right? Thromboembolism we usually see after long term uh, ambulation, uh, immobilization. Right? Next. A 12-year-old male patient presents with bloating, steatoria, HLA-DQ2 defect. Which of the following is the best treatment? Now, this was a slightly non-specific uh, complaint or history. The patient has bloating and steatoria. Whenever we have a history of steatoria, that is fatty, greasy stools, we start thinking in terms of celiac disease or a malabsorption syndrome, right? Not basically celiac disease per se directly. First, whenever you have a history of steatoria, you will start thinking in terms of malabsorption syndrome, right? When my patient has got a malabsorption syndrome, what malabsorption syndromes am I talking about? One of the common ones which is associated with HLA-DQ2 and HLA-DQ8 is celiac disease. That is why here, uh, what is the best treatment? What is celiac disease students? It is gluten sensitive enteropathy. My patient cannot have anything which has gluten in the diet. So, the answer here is low gluten diet. Understood? Easy question. What was the clincher? HLA-DQ2. This is HLA-DQ2 and DQ8 associated. This was asked in NEAT exam four years back, right? Uh, what are the other points about celiac disease? My patient cannot have brow. What is brow? Barley, rye, oats and wheat. My patient cannot have these four things. My patient can have rice, patient can have maize, right? The other MCQs which can ask, which is the skin disorder which is usually seen in a patient of celiac disease? Answer is it increases a bullous disorder of uh, the risk that is dermatitis herpetiformis. What is the lymphoma which this patient can be... Uh, increased risk of the answer is enteropathy associated T cell lymphoma understood lastly the histopathology which has also been asked a lot of times when I see the biopsy three things are very important students one is called villus atrophy in this image can you people appreciate the villus are very very small atrophic normally the villi are like this here we have villus atrophy villus are like this right then we have crypt hyperplasia. Can you see increase in the number of crypts here? And the third thing which is very difficult to see here is increased number of intraepithelial lymphocytes. So, when all these three things are present, villus atrophy, crypt hyperplasia and increase in the number of intraepithelial lymphocytes, we start thinking in terms of celiac disease and sometimes we can also do a score for this which is called as a MARSH score. So, another question can be MARSH score is used for answer is celiac disease. Easy? Next. Histopathological picture of a ulcerated nodule at the tip of nose measuring 
0.3 centimeter was shown what is the diagnosis see there was a ulcerated nodule on the tip of nose and this was the histopathology which was shown the options were keratocanthoma does not look like that basal cell carcinoma basal cell carcinoma remember blue cells blue tumor can you see this looks like a very very blue tumor nests of these basaloid cells are seen yes so basal cell carcinoma very blue tumor we have nests of basaloid cells i'll tell you the other points we have third uh, the fourth option which is a melanoma third option rather in melanoma students usually they will say something like uh, uh, maybe exposure to radiation and they will some say something like a brownish or a blackish pigmentation which is seen even when you see the slide you will see this melanin pigment commonly right this is does not look like a melanoma squamous cell carcinoma will show the presence of keratin pearls do you see keratin pearls here no i see these nests of cells which look extremely blue so these are basaloid cells right see these are the nests of basaloid cells which i am talking about when you see the high power students can you people appreciate this these are basaloid cells and they were very characteristically show something which is called peripheral palisading so this is one nest student and in this nest on the outside edge you see the nuclei are arranged parallelly like a fence this is called as peripheral palisading and these are basically separated from one another that is also called as retraction artifact right retraction artifact or separation clefts which are present right so this the answer was a basal cell carcinoma here the answer was a basal cell carcinoma because the image which they showed looks like a basal cell carcinoma you know in all four of skin tumors what you will see correct next a 10 year old male presents with edema and anasarca diagnosis of minimal change disease was made minimal change disease you all know that minimal change disease is the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in children right which of the following is true let us see the option response well to steroids absolutely correct this is the correct you have to tell the steroid uh, correct statement this is true it responds very well to steroids light microscopy shows effacement of podocytes some students mark this does the light microscopy shows effacement of podocytes no students minimal change disease is called as minimal change because no change on light microscopy the electron microscopy will show effacement of podocytes and not the light microscopy so this is a wrong option common in adults no it is the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in children there is non selective proteinuria no there is selective proteinuria not non selective proteinuria so this is also not the correct answer what is the correct answer it responds very well to steroids easy next a middle aged woman presents with painless slow growing neck swelling so the patient has very slow growing neck swelling the lymph node was positive biopsy of the lymph node is given below which of the statements is not true right now a patient with a slow growing neck swelling lymph node positive what is one diagnosis which i keep in my mind is papillary carcinoma of thyroid and when you see this image can you all appreciate that the cells are arranged in papillae and the few of the cells have got empty nuclei leave that aside can you people appreciate these basophilic things these are actually samoma bodies so when i see this kind of a image with a patient with neck swelling and lymph node positive we start thinking in terms of papillary carcinoma of thyroid right now what are which of the following is not true about papillary cancer nuclear features are characteristic that is absolutely true spreads through lymphatics absolutely true excellent prognosis absolutely true fnac is not diagnostic fnac is diagnostic so which of the following statement is not true students answer is fnac is not diagnostic because fnac is diagnostic definitely in papillary carcinoma of thyroid in which type of thyroid malignancy fnac is not diagnostic follicular carcinoma of thyroid easy 
let us see other things because papillary cancer and thyroid malignancies are one of the most sought after topic by the examiner. If they ask you most common thyroid malignancy papillary, the least common is anaplastic. Best prognosis papillary, worst prognosis anaplastic, right? If they ask you the risk factors which were asked in the previous NEET exam students, ionizing radiation, thyroglossal cyst and Hashimoto's thyroiditis are risk factors for papillary and long-standing goiter, iodine deficiency or multinodular goiter is seen in follicular cancer. All of them arise from follicular cells except medullary cancer which arises from the parafollicular cells, right? Then uh, papillary cancer usually metastasizes by lymphatic root, follicular cancer usually metastasizes by hematogenous root. Genetically, students in papillary, we see BRAF red PTC mutation. In follicular, we see KRAS or PI3K mutation. Medullary is associated with red on chromosome 10 mutation and MENTU syndrome, correct? Microscopically, you all know papillary. I'll just show you five important points. You see papillae, orphan ania and nuclei. We see coffee bean nuclei, that is a nuclei with a nuclear groove. We see inclusions and we see samoma bodies. So, five important points on the microscopy of papillary cancer of thyroid, right? Follicular, we will see follicles along with capsular and vascular invasion. Medullary, you will see amyloid. What kind of amyloid? The amyloid is A, cal or calcitonin, right? And anaplastic, nothing, correct? So, this is very, very important students. Let me show you all the images because they are usually asked. Can you people appreciate that the cells are arranged in these papillae? And when I see these cells students, see, better picture I'll show you here. Can you people appreciate that these cells have got nuclei which are totally clear? So, these optically cleared nuclei are called as orphan any eye nuclei, optically cleared nuclei, right? Then students, the next thing is nuclear grooves. Can you see these are the grooves which are present? So, these longitudinal grooves, the nuclei start looking like a coffee bean. That is why these are co called coffee bean nuclei. And then we have got these inclusions inside the nuclei which are called as nuclear pseudo inclusions. Lastly, I can see Samoma bodies. In which all conditions do you see Samoma body students? Papillary carcinoma of thyroid, papillary renal cell carcinoma. Then uh, uh, what else? Serum serous cystadeno carcinoma of ovary, meningioma, prolactinoma and mesothelioma. Right. Next important point is in which conditions do you see coffee bean nuclei? That is also an MCQ and a flashcard. Papillary carcinoma of thyroid, Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Brenner's tumor, chondroblastoma and granulosa cell tumor of ovary. Understood in detail about papillary cancer and thyroid malignancies, right? With the stu uh, students, we finish off with the questions which were asked in the NEET exam regarding from pathology. I would say except for two questions, all of them were very straightforward and easy ones. And if you have revised your concepts very easily and thoroughly, you would have been able to answer most of them correctly, right? They were easy questions. They were not tricky questions, right? Thank you so much, everyone, and all the best.